here we are. You're watching Superscom.com. This is Carlos Reale, and here with the man, the Bobby Blitz. So thank you so much, Bobby, for having us Carlos. over here and giving you, giving us a little bit of your time. This is what it's all about, making it to Superscom. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, man, thanks. <laughs> we'll bug you with a few questions. I'm sure you know the same way. You probably answered some of them a million times. Hopefully, we'll give you some interesting ones, some new ones. See what you got to say about it. Right now, of course, you guys are touring and celebrating your 17th studio release in the Electric Age. So, of course, congrats to you and the band for making it this far and with such a great career. Um, basically, you know, you're in the middle of the tour right now, the Kill Fest, and well, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the album. Tell us about, you know, the third album recorded at Gear Studios. Uh, how's the tour going? Uh, how are the fan reception for the album, for example? So, tell us a little bit about the initial reaction since it only came like a month ago. So, well, you know, it, it's it's all a blur, and that's <laughs> but that's actually a good thing because that means things are moving, and that also means the record's moving, and all of a sudden. You wake up one morning and you're in Denver, <laughs> and you're talking to Super Scum. But the, but the idea is, is that I think that it worked out very well. I mean, this record was um, about eight months in assembly, and I think one of the unique things we did on this record that we hadn't done in the past was, you know, we would demo, uh, we get the songs would start developing, we dropped in the drum tracks, we got great tones for the tracks, boom, we're off on the road doing something in Europe. And then we come back, we drop in some bass, Dee Dee's down there working at the studio, boom, we're off on the road. The guitars come, boom, we're off on the road. Vocals, South American tour. So all this happened, and that was the reason for the eight months. But I think that one of the things the Electric Age holds that's a little unique uh, to maybe other records is that we were out on the road in between this tracking. So the every time a thrash band goes in you always want to have that live vibe on the record and this was very easy for us to do because we were just playing we were doing tours and coming back and forth. you know one one moment i'm in santiago chile the next moment i'm behind the mic in the studio you know dropping vocals in and i think that that became the x factor for the electric age and that's why it seems like a blur because it was so busy through that time period and now we're out in the road we're like you know, a week plus deep into it, and we're getting these reactions that it is a live record. It does feel right. I mean, you know, when people want to hear your new stuff, you feel uh, satisfied with regard to the time you put in. If people want to hear your old stuff, I'm like, ah, I'm a little disappointed, you know? I mean, sure, I like playing the old stuff. I mean, I get a kick out of seeing people have a good time. I enjoy people. But if they're loving the new stuff, I'm loving that place, man, because it means the new stuff has impact. So I think that that's what we're getting right now with regard to the tour, with regard to the Electric Age and the release, is that we're making impact, meaning we're relevant in uh, you know, uh, April, May 2012, not just relevant in uh, May 1988. <laughs> How many songs from the new record you have uh, incorporated into your set list right now for this tour? Uh, we'll be doing four. Yeah, we're doing four. Um, we're opening with Come and Get It. Um, we have Electric Rattlesnake in. Uh, wish you were dead and save yourself. Uh, but then we're doing some stuff off Ironbound too, so it really feels kind of like six or so new songs, and so that's a third of the set. So I, I mean, that feels right. So good. Um, you are, like I said, in the middle of the Killfest tour. The U.S. leg ends in uh, mid-May, and then you head over to the European leg of the tour. Mm -hmm. June, July, you have a bunch of fests going on uh, in Romania, Italy, Finland. So can you give us a little bit about, like I said, the impression of the tour so far and what you're looking forward to for the rest of the tour that you're going to be actually performing Bill, practically for the rest of the year? Well, you know, it, the, the Finnish girls always have longer legs than the Italian girls. <laughs> But I think we all know that. <laughs> It doesn't mean that it, it, it doesn't mean that one's more beautiful than the other. And but but you know one of the reasons I like traveling is to have fun and and see people and have a good time. Um, and what we'll do is we'll obviously have to adapt a set because we won't be headlining through all of this. You know, I mean, if if I have 90 minutes, for instance, in Denver, um, it, it doesn't mean I have 90 minutes in Tuska, in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, it means that I'm probably playing for an hour. So it's going to be. Uh, not an 18 song set, but uh, possibly 12. Okay. You know, so, but we adapt and it's, it's really just a cut. Um, you know, I think it's necessary, and especially the way uh, when, you, when you're presenting this music that you come off like a, a well oiled machine. It's, it's, a, it's a big part of pride I have in me is that this band, um, this band doesn't have bad nights. We've had 
Some nights are better than others, but nobody goes out there to fail. You always go out to win. Now you may lose, <laughs> but you go out to win. And I think that that is really the idea. So if we just start cutting songs over the set, for instance, that we're doing tonight in Denver, we're going to be that well-oiled machine um, when we're doing these festivals. Yeah, no, and the best of luck, because that looks like a really heavy tour schedule and a very good one, of course. Um, back in 2009, you signed with Nuclear Blast, and this is practically you know, your latest release with them. Although in the U.S., you are with Entertainment One Music, right? A division of I think, Koch Records, or however it is pronounced. My apologies. It's always a mess to find out. <laughs> but, uh, Some but, people call it cock. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's what I was trying to prevent from going cock records. Yeah, so, you were holding it pretty But yeah, I was, I was trying to be PC and go with Koch Records. So, basically, how has the relationship been with the two labels? Is it working out for the band? Uh, basically, what, what has been the experience so far? You know, uh, first and foremost, you brought up Nuclear Blast. Um, the, the thing that I like about Nuclear Blast, they handle us everywhere but North America. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the idea with these guys are that it's guys in, you know, black t-shirts with heavy metal band logos on them. You know, you, you walk in, you're talking to the President Marcus, he's wearing an Exodus shirt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're in the right place. Yes. And so, so you... There's a, there's a comfortable uh, kind of a measure there with regard to, if we're working hard on this, we know they're working hard on it. And I'll give you the other side of it in a quick story, and that's, you know, Didi and I were sitting in New York in uh, 1993, I think it was the I Hear Black record, and we were on Atlantic Records, and we were sitting in an office with a big oak desk, and I forget who the promo guy was, but he had on, you know, a Pierre Cardin suit, and he excused himself. Uh, to take a phone call after he gave us the promotional plan. And I looked at Didi and I said, we're fucked. <laughs> this guy doesn't know anything about us. <laughs> and you left him after that album, so... <laughs> Point being is that with Nuclear Blast, you're dealing with fans who love this kind of stuff, so great label. E1, on the other hand, is a bigger machine, but has a pocket of real metalheads. Um, Steve Seabury has worked uh, with other labels with us, Spitfire, a guy named Bill Meese who's a great um, promotions guy and they pay so much attention to detail that I mean you know we charted with um, the Electric Age at number 77 due to their work too, not just due to the strength of the record. I mean these, those guys made sure people knew that this record was coming. So I think that we're in a good position. You know, you know our, our thinking always is that you know we manage the band, don't put all your eggs in one basket because if you know if it all falls down on one label you're in, you're in a bad situation. So it, this the only reason of separating the two was uh, was was business, and they still have a great relationship together and coordinated. So I think we're in the right place for for all territories in the world at this point. Thirty two years of a career, man, with Overkill, and you know you guys have not stopped. You haven't disbanded, you know, retired, unretired, came back, did a farewell tour. You haven't done any of that stuff. Yeah. Throughout your 32-year career, which is amazing, of course, congratulations to you and Overkill. Um, as a fan, like I said, I'm very happy to have you and the band ongoing in every project. Like I said, 17th studio album, my God, are you kidding me? It's, it's amazing that Overkill has produced so many albums, so, so much good music. How do you guys do it? How do you guys, how have you gotten here? What has helped? What hasn't helped? Basically, what is your take on that career that non-stop, by the way, so... Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't speak for Didi. I mean, obviously, we I, I can speak for myself and, and just to try to simplify it. You, you know, it's not about getting somewhere. It's about going to there. So it's more about the journey. And I think that if I had high expectations about reaching a spot uh, in my life, that I wouldn't enjoy that journey. Because these were, there, there was times you said, you know, when bands had to disband and, and then reunions ensued after that. And the scene wasn't very healthy. I, I remember a time there was 80 thrash metal bands in a room in December. By January there was eight. <laughs> you know, we happened to be one of them. But our, our thinking was always that there was, you know, it was a huge commitment to this because it's what we love to do. It gave us huge amounts of satisfaction. I think one of the other things, and, and this is, this is kind of unique because this is not the most ballsy thing, but I think our families actually understand this, that this is, 
you know, uh, the women and children in our lives understand that this is what makes the men who they are. And these are the men they love. And I think that that is uh, a, a great reason why this has happened for this amount of time. And they'll never ever get the credit for it except for my mouth. But They deserve it. But it, You're 100% yes. correct. I mean, this is not the easiest thing to do when you have babies growing up. And, and, and we used to turn the back... We would be touring in the 90s, and the back of this bus looked like a baby nursery. So, <laughs> and it'd be just so we could keep doing shows, there'd be people walking down the bus. We'd always have a woman tour manager, and, it, and she'd go, Shh, <laughs> the baby's asleep. Oh, baby. But we could still bang our heads in Portland, and we could still bang our heads in Berlin, and Boston, and New York, and Tokyo. And that was a great trade off for us. <clears throat> and I think that they deserve a lot of the credit for that. I mean, we, sure, we're, we're, we're committed, we're motivated, we love it. I mean, there's no two ways about that. But could that have happened with the phone calls of, when are you going to get this shit up? You're just not bringing home enough money. <laughs> and that never happened once. So that's uh, good for you, yes, girls. <laughs> a touring question that, I, that I've always had, um, between around 1995 and 2005, um, you didn't tour, or you didn't, you weren't that present in U.S. stages, if you will, that often compared to heavy European touring. <coughs> so I wanted to ask you that that decade-long absence from American stages, what was it about? Was it just a commercial reasons? Was it lack of fan interest? I mean, what happened there? I know your health, of course, was involved, uh, but what was it? Ten years. And, you know, over here in American stages and American tours. Well, it's a good point, and I think it seems like that, but it's not 100% true. The, yeah. What happened is we weren't present west of the Mississippi. That's true, yeah. It was the East we, Coast show. We yeah. were very present from yes, Chicago East, and mm -hmm. the, the idea was um, that we would continue to tour even on break-even if we could, but we had to be able to present ourselves as overkill. Um, you guys got a peek at what we did in here tonight. This is still how we presented ourselves in the 90s. It wasn't two broken amplifiers and a crappy drum set. There were, you know, fabricated metal pieces that we had up and huge backdrops and, you know, uh, uh, six stacks of amplification. I mean, we got nine cabinets on each side in here. So that 10 year period, we were doing it at a very high level on the other side. And we would do three runs uh, in the US there. And still, actually, we're selling more records in the U.S. So it's really a promoter issue. The scene wasn't that healthy, you know. And if somebody says, "Hey, we'd love to have you in Denver," we'd give you 500 bucks. We'd say, you know, you can't do that yeah. because it takes you it takes you three days to get to Denver from somewhere else, <laughs> and we want to present ourselves like this. So it was really a business decision that, and our thinking about it was that regardless of whatever happens, and we, we can't look into the future, and we can't see tomorrow, that we'll always be considered a band that presented themselves at the highest level every time. That it was a quality product. That no one could say, oh yeah, they came out here and they, you know, they were okay, they had two broken lights and uh, we just wouldn't do those shows. So that, it was just a philosophy we had to, to keep up the quality of the product. A highly respectful quality standard, I guess, for the yeah, band and for the fans. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that even as a fan. Cause, you know, I miss you guys for that, that long over here. But you're finally here again. This is around your fourth show. Over here. I mean, you came with Gigantour. Then sure. you had other opening acts as well. Then now you're headlining over here. And, of course, a pleasure to see you guys back. But... Um, Along the lines, you know, with the band and the discography, this one, once again, celebrating the 17th album, studio album out. Are there any plans? Can fans look out for any remastered editions of the old catalog? What's going on there? Because, man, Years of the K remastered would totally kick ass. That I can't wait for that one. Hopefully it will happen. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, you know, I mean, and I don't want to be rude, but you haven't been listening. <laughs> No, no, no. Hey, man, give it to me. <laughs> it's, it's about today for me. Um, I, I think that every step is necessary, and I, I think every step has got historical value, uh, even with regard to the technology of that day versus this day. And uh, I sat down with a guy from Brave Words, and he goes, everybody else is remastering their stuff. And I said, it doesn't mean I have to. Or we have to. Fair. We want to. We want to release Immortalis and Ironbound, and we want to release the Electric Age, and we want to have more value for what is than what was. 
And, you know, hey, if you see that remaster, it means in my head that I'm done. <laughs> so I'm not going there. Okay, okay. you know, it's... We're still, I mean, don't worry, I still listen to it regardless. Yes, it's it, it will never go away, are you kidding me? It's like, how many years I've been listening to it? But yeah, well, it's good to know you're focusing more on the new stuff, and that's also, of course, like you said, the band direction for it, and that's highly respectable as well. And I guess some people can remaster their own stuff in their own computer if they want to. <laughs> okay, and, and other bands can do that too. I mean, that's their decisions. But we've always paid more attention to our own house than other people's, so. I hear you now. I have an interesting question that I wanted to make. Um, I'm going to involve Charlie in this one. And just pretty much your mascot, yep. Charlie. So I'm going to chug it to him. Charlie says that Will Owens still remains a dick. So what the hell is up with that, man? <laughs> this, it, this has nothing to do with me. This is one of the other guys in the band. This was a guitar maker. <laughs> who, who took this guy's guitars and never returned them. This is Ironbound and the Electric Age shit going yes. on here. <laughs> and Charlie, the person in the band, I uh, just don't want to mention his name. That's what I mean, we're saying Charlie, man. Person I'm going with Charlie. Charlie, who runs the website, is a guy in the band. So Charlie is, Charlie says, if you go to the website. I know, yeah. That's, that's actually I, one of the guys in the band. Eric. That's why I'm asking the question this way. I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody. He lost his guitars. And this guy never called them back, and they're probably sitting in a garage somewhere, and I think down in the Virginias, or uh, down in either West Virginia or Virginia, because he used to come to DC shows, so Maryland maybe. So that was the problem. So Will, if you're looking at this, you're still a dick. Yeah, just send the guitars back. <laughs> and just send the fucking guitars back, man. <laughs> so basically, um, if you don't mind, just talking a little bit personal here, um, you. For a lot of fans, you can be seen as a motivational force within the metal community. Um, you beat cancer, you're a cancer survivor. You also had um, your mild stroke or a minor stroke survivor as well. And basically, you know, I wanted to see any words that you wanted to have for any fans or people out there that kind of stem from your experience with this and you're here singing your ass off, headbanging your ass off with all the energy in the world. Drinking beer, smoking cigarettes. Yeah, I'm thinking to myself, it's, like it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but hey, no, no problem. Uh, no judgment. Yeah. It's just any motivational words you have for people that might going be going through the same thing. Anything you would like to relate to them well, in different ways, in any way that you know. It's just. I mean, of course, I'm sensitive to this with uh, with other people. I mean, you know, I always believe that we that we in this part of the music community have a true community Definitely. you know that he may be a friend of mine but that means he's also a friend of yours it, because we look for the same things uh, with regard to that personally it would there were it was predisposition and a real freak thing with the, the whole cancer situation uh, not normal under the circumstances um, I refuse to kind of bend to any of the addictions I have because I kind of think they make them me. <laughs> they make me who I am to some degree. Uh, and I like them very much. But uh, the way I got through it was uh, was really simple. And uh, it, it took some time to understand it. But it was, I could either live in the problem or I could live through the problem. And I realized that many other people have heavier crosses to bear than I had. Uh, but if I looked to say that there was another side to this, even if I didn't like that result. That if I'm only, I can't choose. I'm, I used to thought I dealt the cards, you know? But now I only found out I was a player in the game. And I wasn't even holding a pair of twos. <laughs> no deuces, no nothing. And I thought to myself, if I live in this problem, it'll destroy me. If I live through this problem, I'll come out the other side. I may not be able to do overkill. I may not be able to do anything but I'll still get through the problem. And it became the most motivational thing that uh, I devised through this, you know, and probably with the help of other people. I'm not that smart. You know, <laughs> you know people are probably giving me advice along the way and it probably uh, formulated through the advice of other people. But I lived through it, not in it. We're glad to have you here, man, seriously. So yeah. for last, you know, we always leave the space up to you and the band, you know, whatever you want to say to your fans, any last words, 
please go ahead and look at the camera and tell them whatever the hell you want, man. <laughs> hey, baby, it's the electric age. Hang on. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. We really appreciate My you pleasure, giving Bobby. us your time, man. Right. It was a pleasure interviewing you. Good luck with uh, the rest of the tour, with the new album. Good luck to Overkill for many, many more years to come, my friend. I hope you come back to Denver and visit us more often. You have in the last year, so of course, like you said, keep going towards that goal, man. And like you always say, because I'm quoting you on this one, you know, keep doing what you do best, which is overkill. <laughs> <laughs> have a good one, man. Thank you so much. <laughs>